word, man. Those are good words. Those are things that we have to keep in mind because, like I said, tomorrow is not promised. It's not something we like to dwell upon. It's not like something we, uh, we try to keep inside our minds because you get a little depressing, uh, as you know. But the, but the thing is this. Can I tell you this? If you have Christ as your Savior, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. No. You don't have to worry about those things. You can, you can focus on what you need to focus on. And uh, so it's a good word, Blake. It's a good word, Blake. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, tonight, we're continuing our series talking about opening your eyes. And tonight, I want to talk about opening your eyes and taking an eye exam. And I don't mean eye exam. I mean an eye exam. Ooh. I'm talking about an eye exam. I'm talking about running yourself, running yourself through this. Why? Because, like in the skit here, you oftentimes can be your worst enemy. Now, I know we say the devil is our enemy. True that. But let me tell you something. Even worse than that is us. It is. We are. We sit there and we judge ourselves. And I give big credit to all of you who are on the video tonight talking about what you like about yourself. Sometimes that's a struggle. Some of you even share some of the things you didn't like about yourself. That's okay too. That's just honesty. And it's okay for some days to just not feel it. The older I get, I have that. I, look, you, the things do not change. I'm sad to say. I would like to tell you that you're gonna, you are going to grow in confidence. You are going to grow in these things. But you're still going to look in that mirror. You're going to watch yourself get older. You're going to watch yourself, uh, you know, it's partially why I'm growing this facial hair. It's just kind of do something different so I don't have to look the same, same face every day. I want to, now it's got to be gone in July. My wife don't like it. So, I know. Let's take a quick, quick poll just in case I need to tell my wife. I'm going to be like the beat. Woo! Woo! Okay, let's have it. I'm going to be like, nah, I'm not feeling it. Okay, it's all right, it's all right, uh, that's okay. Uh, but how many of you think I ought to do, do this to uh, do something to please my wife? Yeah, yeah. That's 100%, yeah. Do this to please your Boys, boys, I'm just going to encourage you right now. Do things to please your wife. I, I'm just going to tell you right now, you can get over it right now. And if you're soon, whatever, wherever you to marry somebody, just do what your wife says. That's right. Listen, yeah. you're going to argue, you're going to argue anyway, and she is going to win. When we start becoming our own worst enemy, it all comes back to that story in Genesis. Who had my Genesis scripture? Who had my Genesis scripture? Come on. Genesis. Genesis 2, 1 to 4. We go back to the garden because this is where sin came from, right? There's this origin story of being locked into this. How did we get there even? This goes back in the story a little bit from when Adam and Eve discovered their eyes were open and discovered that they were naked, discovered that they were now ashamed versus being confident. Can I tell you what? When you're in Christ, you're, you, you, there's a confidence there. When you're not in Christ, there's, there's, there's that shame. There's those things that we sense and feel. And this is how it happened. Thus, it, thus the heavens and the earth were complete in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating all that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Okay. Hold on. That's why God, I gave her. It should be chapter three. Let's try that again. Let's go with this one. Yeah. Yep. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees of the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will, cert well, 
you will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Okay. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Now, so the first thing the devil does in that scenario is question what God said. He says, Did God really tell you that? Did he really say don't eat from the tree? Did he really say don't do that? Because God's just jealous, to be honest with me. God's just jealous that if you go and do that, you're going to know that you're going to be evil, your eyes are going to be open, and boy, is it going to be, you're going to be on an awesome ride. You, you really, you really should do that. And where it comes with us is this, is we start to doubt what God tells us. And the devil comes in, and our own mind works on us. Does God really say that I'm saved because I prayed a prayer? And you'll go home and doubt that you even knew God. you go home and say, I don't even know what even I experienced here. The doubt begins to creep in. But here's the deal. If you will take a look in this Bible here, the scriptures, I'm telling you, God is always speaking. And he is always speaking the truth to you. He is always telling you who you are. You can look, I mean, look, we go through this. Uh, it's no different. Uh, your counselors do it. I go through it. All those things, we go through these things. Because we question the things that God tells us. We question our worth, our value, all these things. See, Satan had an eye problem in the first place. If you read through the scriptures and understand the, set, the, the history of Lucifer, if you will, as the story goes in the Old Testament, that Satan, Lucifer at the time, was part of the choir, worship, uh, a leader of worship. He got to a uh, high on himself. Who, who has Isaiah? Who has Isaiah? Come on, Isaiah. I need you to read this because it really gives a great description of what Satan, Satan's problem really, really what? So if you will go to the scripture there and read that for us. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did be in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my heron above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Okay. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. Listen. What did he say there? I will ascend. I will go up on the mountain. I will be like God. I will be like the most high. Can I tell you something? That he had an eye problem. He tried to be in control of his whole world. And for that, he paid the price because the Lord cast him down. And said, look, you can't do that. You're not going to raise up against me. But listen, you, you have and I have an eye problem in two ways. Number one, we think too less of ourselves. We think we're stupid, we're ugly, we're not smart. We go over this in our mind. And it's funny how the more you repeat that, the more you start to believe it. You start to believe what other people say about you versus what God says about you. So the first thing that happens to you is, as, as new Christians or even as older Christians, you start saying things like, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a very good Christian, or I'm not very holy, or I'm not very good. Let me tell you something. God didn't save you because you were good and you were holy. God saved you because you're not good and you're not holy. It's okay. That's how you came into a relationship with God. It's because you weren't great. The other part of that is what Satan had. It says you think too much of yourself. You say, I am my own boss. I run my own life. I don't need anyone else. I will show everybody. I don't need God. Well, that's a pretty arrogant statement. Considering that, you know, the breath in your lungs is from him. Go ahead and give God back his breath and see what happens. I don't need God. You just go to the bottom time for that, why don't you? I don't need God. All right, just give him back his breath then. Because the Bible says that's how he breathed life into us. And we can be so arrogant and so proud and so full of ourselves that we think we can do this life on our own. And it's simply not true. You know, Jesus tells a story. Can I get Mark chapter... 10. Put my Mark chapter 10 on me. I want to break this down for you guys. So watch yourself. Don't think too little of yourself and don't think too much of yourself. It's a fine balance that you have. 
But there's a story here I want to talk about. Jesus meets another blind man. And here's that story. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was just was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. All right, good job. So the man says, he hears Jesus coming down the road, and he starts yelling, Jesus, have pity on me. Have mercy on me. I, he, you know why he's saying that? He says, I know who I am. I'm a blind beggar. That's what I am. Have pity on me. Have mercy on me. I need you, Jesus, because I am blind, and I beg every day to get money so that I can eat. He knows who he is. Some of us can't admit that we are what we are. Sometimes we can't, you know, I don't know if you've ever had that conversation with your parents where you were right and they were wrong. I don't know if you've ever had that conversation. But let me tell you something. It's hard to say when you're wrong. It's hard to admit it. It's hard for your parents to admit it. You know what I'm saying? It's hard for them to say it. And so, you have to be willing to say at the very beginning, I understand why I need Jesus. I understand I need pity. I need mercy. Because I know who I am. I know the things I've done. I know how I've acted. I know how I've treated people. I know what my thoughts are for, uh, for people. I know. God knows my very heart. And instead of saying, God, I don't need you, or defending yourself and saying, God, look at me. I'm a pretty good person. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're pretty good people, then why did Jesus die on the cross? Because we're not pretty good people, Rock. Well done, sir. I'm just telling you, if you think you're that great and you're all that, then explain to me why Jesus had to die on the cross for people who are already so good. Because he didn't die for good people. He died for people who are sinful. He died for people who needed him, like this blind beggar. God has mercy on those who know they're blind. They know they're in bad shape and they want to see. This man wanted to see so bad. He was willing to face the crowds. He was willing to scream above the noise and say, I need to get the rabbi's attention. I need to get Jesus' attention. I want to see so bad. And there's some people here that say you care less if you see anything. You're like, look, I just want to get on with my life. Look, this Jesus thing is great, but you know, I gotta get back on with my work. I gotta get back into my hustle. I gotta get back into my schoolwork. I gotta get into I gotta get into what I want. See, that's the problem, is that's the I problem. It's what I want, not what God wants for me. We have to reach a place where we say, I need what God has. So how do we know then that uh, that God has mercy on us then? How do we know that? Well, the scripture says Proverbs 334, who has it? I need Proverbs 334 and Luke 18, 9 through 14. Come on up. Proverbs 334, Luke 18, 9 through 14. Come on up. Which one do you have? Proverbs? Great. You're first. Okay? Read first. How do we know? Once again, you notice that every time I bring these folks up to read scripture to you. Because I want them to see it. And I want you to hear them reading it. Your peers, not just me. You don't think, well, that's just preacher talk. That's some preacher getting upset. Look, the scripture is the scripture, whether I read it or whether they read it. It's just as powerful whether I read it or whether they read it. In fact, it can be even more powerful in their hands because they're your peers reading it to you. So I want you to know that God has something to say about a lot of things in his word. So how do we know then that God doesn't like the proud? And here's the scripture. He mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to humble and oppressed. There you go. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. 
He mocks the proud. God mocks the proud. God said, oh, you got this all under control. Okay, wait till life hits. Can I tell you something? I didn't talk about it for the past couple of days because I don't want to talk about pandemics. I just don't. I don't want to talk about sickness. I don't want to talk about all this. It drives me crazy. It's driving people insane. It's driving people out of their jobs. It's driving people to the poorhouse. It's, it's, crea it's, it's creating divorce situations. It's, I don't want to talk about all those things. But can I tell you something? There was a lot of proud people that when this pandemic hits, I guarantee you they weren't proud for very long. Because they found out real fast that they needed Jesus and they needed a miracle to save their house, to save their car, to save their job. Isn't that amazing? That when bad things happen, suddenly Jesus becomes of interest to us.